thank you sir thank you very much yeah sorry for the inconvenience i no don't problem. know how it happened and uh, google is also misbehaving now <laughs> no problem no problem right so now we can formally start the program so yes, I, uh, dr shiva first of all uh, welcome from our side and sorry for some technical uh, glitch in between thank you sir no problem and uh, being a uh, secretary ssme i request uh, mr jigar gandhi uh, to start the today's event yes mr jigar please go ahead yeah uh, thank you on behalf of ssme i jigar gandhi executive member of ssme cordially welcome to speakers office bearers webinar sponsor alter and team all members students and all audience join through online platform ssme uh, means the space society of mechanical engineers came into existence on 6th april 1988 at space application center isro ahmedabad it is a registered society under government of gujarat the basic aim of ssme is to promote awareness about technological advancements in the field of space mechanical and allied engineering ssme is having 375 plus life members from various isro centers faculty members from engineering colleges professional working in industries and r&d institutions ssme also offers student membership and having 13 corporate institutional members to promote knowledge create awareness and spread recent trends and futuristic developments of various aspects of mechanical engineering related to space ssme initiated webinar series by online platform today's talk is the fourth lecture in this series title of the talk is 3d printing for aerospace applications and will be presented by dr shiva s i would like to mention that yesterday Uh, 7th December was an International Civil Aviation Day. Uh, Dr. Shiva S is an Assistant Professor in Department of Mechanical Engineering in Indian Institute of Technology, Jammu. He completed his B.E. in Mechanical Engineering and M.E. in Production Engineering. He has attained his Ph.D. from IIT Indore and was pursuing his postdoc at IIT Madras prior to his tenure at IIT Jammu. laser based additive manufacturing and laser surface processing are the key areas of research of dr shiva he is having many publications conference proceedings and book chapters he is also having an indian patent for one of his product developed by shape memory alloys he is the recipient of the prestigious newton bhava fellowship funded by royal academy of engineering london out of which he was working as visiting researcher at the institute of for manufacturing Uni university of cambridge apart from academic experience he also has an industrial experience currently he is pursuing his active research currently he is pursuing his active research in the line of wire arc additive manufacturing he is now currently exploring the possibilities of fabricating mechanical components using wire arc additive manufacturing through a project funded by drdo with this introduction i welcome today's speaker dr shiva s and hand over to him for the talk thank you thank you thank you very much for the kind introduction sir without wasting much of a time <laughs> i will just uh, directly jump to the presentation just a small clarification my presentation is visible to the audience sir is it fine hello sir is my hello. presentation visible no not yet not yet one second um uh now sir one second yeah is it visible now sir yes yes completely yes 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 no yes 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 thank you thank you thank you very much for the kind introduction sir and good afternoon all to the respective members of ssme and i thank all uh, for a for a good opportunity extended to me i also like uh, since uh, like as our introduction speaker said like uh, 3d printing has been my area of research and i have been actively working in this particular line uh, which is uh, also commonly known as uh, additive manufacturing laser based additive manufacturing now which is uh, taking the world over stump 
So basically, when we check uh, the outline of today's presentation, I'll just walk through a normal introduction about uh, 3D printing and uh, what are the basic components of 3D printing and wire-based 3D printing, how uh, that has been actually been explored by researchers across the globe. And apart from that, uh, 3D printing for aerospace components. Uh, like uh, in this particular module, we will be having a look at what are all the possible ways or like to what level uh, 3D printing and directory manufacturing has been successfully uh, helping us in attaining or like to 3D build uh, components that are being put into real time applications. Uh, Dr. Are... Shiva. Yes, Dr. Sir. Shiva. I think there is a problem in uh, your screen. It's uh, now presentation has gone. So I think uh, you can reshare the presentation. One second, sir. One second. Is my presentation visible, sir? Now it is visible. Please, yeah, now it is visible. Please put it on the full screen mode. Uh, now I have put yeah. it in full screen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it's a visible. Yes. Sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Is the slides changing, sir? I will yes, sir. It's changing, sir. Yes, yes. Fine. So these are the outline of today's talks. Mostly I will be talking about the introduction to 3D printing and the basic 3D printing components and wire-based 3D printing and the importance of 3D printing which has evolved ourselves into this uh, aerospace components that is the topic and so far what are all the components that is being filled in satellite-based application and apart from that aero-based applications which are put in real-time applications, those will be explored. And the final part is our conclusion part. So when you say introduction to 3D printing, when we take a type of like a conventional manufacturing, especially huge components like this aerospace components or this aeronautical components, especially in satellites, rockets, space shuttles, and aeroplanes and aircrafts. In all these domains, there is one thing very common. In conventional manufacturing, uh, the price involved and the overhead cost and the huge amount of cost investment that has been put into this particular line is pretty huge. And as an effect of this, uh, of course, we cannot uh, compromise on the factor of safety on all the three domains that I told as well. In that aspect, uh, there has been a systematic way where the entire designing has been currently carried out. If you can take, it starts with uh, like the design segment where synthesis, analysis and document drawings are being given. From there, eventually that goes to the shop floor where production can be done, planning, raw material, tool procurement and followed by CNC programming. If it is a uh, machine based 3D uh, like uh, conventional machining works where it is known for good precision and uh, time, high uh, skills in good outputs with good quality. <clears throat> from that particular segment, it slowly moves on before it reaches the application level. It reaches the QC packing and then it floats. It is floated into the real-time application and which is the real-time utilization. But now 3D printing totally changed the game because once when we start to deploy 3D printing, we can skip the following steps which totally saves our time and uh, it also saves our type of investments which are to be done in conventionally manufactured products and also there is institutional monitoring which assists whether a close eye can be kept on whatever components that we are fabricating are they, are they up to the mark or are they any sort of defects which are coming in the middle and this in situational monitoring can also assist us in rectifying the errors or any sort of flaws that has been done during manufacturing itself so basically it all depends upon what type of uh, system that we are going to deploy for application and that particular system, what type of raw material is solely required? And this particular raw material to what level has to be processed and what is the quality and how are we going to use them to synthesize the entire product? So these are the primary work that has completely overshadowed all these steps. So it might be simple that it is keeping just the five steps out of this entire process chart. But in reality, that is going to prevent us from wasting a lot of time as well as a lot of money, which is of utmost importance. So when we check in detail, like what are all the basic components of 3D printing, when we go ahead, we find that these are the basic components. Like you have a proper CAD drawing model, 
where uh, the drawing can be made as per our precise dimensions or the product in which we are looking to have for and as an effect of that eventually when we start utilizing them or like you have to convert the product into a proper tool and that particular tool can be used for printing the components directly so basically that product or the design that is used during the CAD file has to be converted into an STL file and you just slice them into programming and you just feed it to the through the software especially G codes the more we have manually operated rather than being an automated conversion we get enough uh, flexibilities in altering the program once when the functioning is going on because if we find that there has to be some sort of institutional alterations or arrangement that has to be done once this programming is under manual control, that will be very much effective. And as it goes in, the final ready-made product is obtained. If you can see the sectional view here of this particular 3D printing technology, which is also known as direct energy deposition, in other words, we will be finding that there is a coaxial feed in the nozzle, which has been kept, and you have the powders fed in a coaxial direction at 45 degree. And at the center, you will be having the high power fiber pulse laser, which is used for melting the products. So as an effect of this, periodically, you use laser as the primary source. And as the chart shows here, this is a normal lab laser based rapid manufacturing system where you will be utilizing a proper CO2 laser and India laser, a diode laser and fiber laser. These are the commonly used laser sources that are widely used for 3D printing and uh, uh, like a layer by layer deposition as well. Then the next important uh, system that comes among the system, uh, entire experimental setup is the material feeding system. Because this particular material feeding system, you can bifurcate them into several ways. Because here, these are the modern types where wire based feeders and powder based feeders pre placed and dynamic glowing. So, what happens here is it may look very simple like uh, this is also one among part of the system but in reality is you will be finding that all these uh, feeding system plays a very very crucial role in the output product reason being is if it is going to be a wire based feeder of course the feeder is going to be rotating in a constant uh, speed so that the feed rate can be easily controlled and of course the flow of that uh, raw material is also easily controlled and that will effectively give us very good output products but in case of a powder based feeder it is a bit tricky and we have to put some serious efforts in maintaining the powder flow very well and second point there is other ways called as like a dynamic blowing and pre-placed bit when it says pre-placed but that is where layer by layer additive manufacturing is assisted where we use this powder based deposition fuel powder based deposition and uh, in other words you can also you say it as a selective laser melting where localized layers can be melted out of the entire pre-placed bed where the powders have been placed and uh, dynamic blowing is nothing but you have two types of operations in dynamic blowing where it will be the entire operation or the entire feeding of powder will be governed by a screw based motor or in other words the carrier gas the gas which is in general used as argon for better deficiency so that without any void or like any sort of flaws that is to be happened in the powder when you say when we use the same carrier gas uh, the control atmosphere gas to be acting as a carrier gas where it dynamically blows the powder which is a sectional view which is shown in our left here so this can be automated using three axis or five axis based workstations where uh, the movement of the nozzle can be manually controlled using a proper uh, G code which is pre-written manually. And if it is also editable, it is in an editable format where you can uh, go with a self-written code that will give us even more better uh, advantage to work freely. When you check the evolution of this additive manufacturing systems or 3D printing systems, we find that initially there is it started with selective laser sintering and uh, from selective laser sintering we it slowly moved on to selective laser melting when you say selective laser sintering what we happen is when we, we in this methodology widely we just used powders as the raw materials it has to be mostly gas atomized powders that will give us some better output in the quality of the product and once when you say get gas atomized powders they are sintered they are not basically completely melted but they are just compacted or they are just bonded to a certain extent where a proper 3D structure can be built and effectively it can be used in real time application as well. So now when the same technology was 
to be adapted for higher end applications like wind turbine like uh, aerojet turbines when these turbines are to be built then slowly the researchers started moving towards a better option where a proper melting and effective bonding is taking place and that is where we had this option of using selective laser melting where uh, the laser is being tracked or like it is being passed periodically within the local area of the powder bed where it is and when you melt according to the movement of this laser head this will effectively melt with the high power lasers so that the laser energy density is sufficient enough to completely melt the powders rather than just bonding the powders so when you melt those powders and when you just uh, keep on building layer by layer printing 3d printing of a real-time component selective laser melting played a crucial role and that was the first step towards getting real-time components and now there were this is where the contribution of materialist came into picture where a lot of material engineers contributed to a great success of this particular technology by able to print 3d print localized uh, microstructures homogeneously throughout the samples and also the components will have certain faces that provides good strength adequate strength and of course a lot of ideas emerged in engineering the composition and uh, taking out uh, certain respective functions out of that material. So when you say you have to engineer the components and when you are like tailoring a complex microstructure, that is where laser engineered net shaping came into picture. In other words, it's also called as DED, where uh, that is the modern evolution of lens technique, DED direct energy deposition as well, where uh, coaxial feed is there, the powders are fed with pre-alloyed state in this particular pre-alloyed state this is where all the researchers started uh, engineering the composition of the powders and uh, effectively like uh, they started converting them into uh, a 3d structured component real-time component where they can meet up certain specific applications with those required specific properties in them so next to that level used this that electron beam building where the electron beams were being deployed in all the other places lasers were widely used where activated photons are used as uh, melting sources of the, the powders and then came e beam where electron beam melting where electron beams were targeted or like were focused at one particular localized area and the similar layer to layer by layer deposition was initiated so these are the periodic uh, evolutions and till date all these machines are utilized in real time application depending upon the usage and depending upon the requirement of the output so when we say this here this is one of the beautiful uh, laboratorial experiment which is available at uh, rrk indore under dr cp paul who is the head of the lamb lab uh, he is Paul Saras, actually my su co-supervisor as well during my PhD days. And uh, this is one. Ex uh, this was one of the first indigenously developed setup which was available in India, and it was thoroughly built in uh, inside uh, Ararka campus by uh, them. And uh, this specific design which they use for building is completely self-made. It is not a standard commercial machine. It was completely completely inmade design. And of course, all the structures and components that they are using to 3D print or like to develop the 3D components, we will be finding that they use a type of this powder feeder. They use a two kilowatt fiber laser system where this fiber laser source is actually kept outside the deposition booth and you have a proper fiber optic cable to assess the laser to enter into the deposition booth. And here, you have the powder feeding system where the powder is being pushed in and uh, this particular powder which is being pushed in can be fed into the coaxial nozzle and the deposition process starts and this particular deposition process if you find it you can see the substrate which is being chucked or it has been holded using a chuck and this particular chuck can move into two axes x and y and we also have the nozzle head which is having this tentacles where you can see the powders uh, from this dual powder feeder on the top can be gushed into this deposition chamber through these tentacles and this gushing job will be done by the argon gas itself which will be acting as a controlled atmosphere which will be used for generating a localized controlled atmosphere and this is the deposition booth which is a glove box which will be completely sealed and they use a proper cnc uh, siemens controller to manually enter the program and get the job done these are the 
uh, this is one of the integrously first built systems in India. And the advantages procured out of this system is we find that it is a novel method of developing some advanced materials. In fact, a lot of uh, uh, smart materials and functional materials are successfully built using this particular deposition technique. And uh, from there, it moves towards composition in study and the complex geometry. And uh, from here, if you check the complex geometry, it comes to picture like whatever may be the complex geometry. You, with the additional effects of this axis of the nozzle and the bed which is moving, we will be able to build it very successfully. These are the advantages. When it comes to disadvantages or like the restrictions, due to the short interaction time of this laser with that particular powder components, eventually a lot of brittle samples will be evolved. So there are now certain methodologies to avoid this brittleness in samples by changing the pattern of deposition and by improving the packing density in the output. We can also take out a lot of uh, samples which are effectively addressing this brittleness issue and low and medium strength of course that is due to the porosity in the samples which was found in the initial days which is also has been effectively addressed now and high residual stress. Of course, when you say residual stress, this is one inevitable problem which is already available and of course it is existing. For that purpose, as of now, researchers like widely they are using a type of uh, post-processing techniques where effectively this can be addressed as well. So these are the three different types and the solution for this is they go for post-processing techniques where the surface level alteration and surface level cracks can be controlled so that that improves the tribological property as well as the nature of the real-time components and also to en enhance ductility and strength in materials which are 3D printed so that that will be effectively utilized for real-time applications. So apart from that, this is also one particular uh, interesting type of 3D printing, which I started working during my postdoc days. And of course, now soon this particular setup is about to be arriving at Jammu as well here. We find that uh, this is a wire-based 3D printing system. So when you say wire-based 3D printing system, uh, we use metal wires and we just directly print. You use a uh, welding source where here in this particular application we have used a CMT cold metal transfer. This is one of the modern technology where uh, unwanted heat distribution in the sample can be controlled due to this effectively hot cracking, hot cracking has also been controlled and also the surface level wetting has been controlled and the very good precise dimensions have been obtained in the 3D printed components. So these are the advancements in uh, 3D printing technology and the biggest advantage of this particular technology you will be finding is uh, this methodology also addresses the issues that were discussed in the previous methodology like uh, void creation, porosity creation and also the brittleness formation. All these uh, particular applications have been in fact very well overcome using this particular uh, uh, technology and you can see the samples that were developed these are the nickel titanium samples and these particular tracks are the different types of tracks patterns either it can be bilamular or unilamular depending upon the amount of residual stress because this is one important care that has to be taken whenever we are optimizing our process for 3d printing any structures like you have to check whether the process has to be unilamular or bilamular to check how much is the heat that is getting accumulated at the end of each and every track and uh, how and to what extent this particular heat is uh, like uh, assisting a perfect bonding in the sample or it is going to create some sort of harm to the sample. So these are the various things that you have to like or we have to keep in mind before going on for uh, 3D printing technologies and uh, other methodologies. And here in this particular technology where CMT I was discussing, you find that you can see the XCT results that are being displayed, the extra computer tomography results which show here. We find that the layer by layer deposition is perfectly done as per the programming. And if you can see the X-ray images, hardly there are any images or errors found. I would say that they are 99.9% .9 porosity free. In fact, the strength that the bond has created between the substrate and the deposition has been really substantially good. Where uh, you can see that, uh, sorry, yeah, you can see that there is not much uh, errors or any sort of voids or any sort of holes, porosities are being present within the samples. 
So this is a typical example where strength and ductility meets because you can see uh, in this particular sample, like uh, for example, let me just mark it. Uh, like uh, I hope uh, this particular sample where I'm showing the stick mark is basically a conventionally available NITA sample where it is made out of casting and it has been imported from foreign countries. Whereas uh, similarly in this one, uh, like uh, the one which I'm, having a horizontal mark in this image you can see this particular sample is nothing but it's a 3d printed sample which is widely uh, like you can see the shape and dimensions of the sample and it has the equal same amount of flexibility and you can see the ductile nature of the sample was also substantially high and uh, you can see the sample which i said the initially that this particular cmt based uh, wire additive manufacturing technology where the temperature can be substantially controlled. And this temperature control, you can see this is the basic reason behind that temperature control. You can see the R getting generated and you can see the pullback effect that has been induced in the electrode wire. So what basically happens is due to the passage of high current, we are able to melt the material very well. And as the material comes in drop with in R, it is in coming in contact with the substrate we find that a type of short circuiting will be induced and uh, as an effect of that induced short circuiting, the electrode wire will be pulled back. And this particular pullback speed that is being pulling back helps us in detachment of the droplet that is being formed and that effectively assists us in building layer by layer deposition. And there was an oscilloscope, uh, oscillometer which was attached along the welding machine, which was being used in this particular process. And we find that the voltage and time scale where periodically that cycle has been happening within that short span of time. So this particular advantage helps us like a, a, a type of interval being induced or a time gap that is being induced assist us in getting a proper uh, high densified welding structures, which is very much helpful for our uh, deposition. So these are the basic advancement in 3D printing. So when we say 3D printing of various components, like for example, this is one particular component which is widely used in turbine blades of uh, like, uh, which is widely used in aerospace applications where these are used in turbine blades and these particular device, this boroscope process was one particular real time application device. You can see the part making process using a powder bed technology here, where the layer by layer powder is being deposited and that laser tracker which passes as per the programming which is being given by the user it starts building layer by layer and you can see the final output product here where the tick mark has been done so this is the final output and you can see the precision in this particular output uh, where the surface finish is substantially good because it might not just uh, rely on what is the type of laser source that you are going to use or like uh, what type of laser parameters we are going to opt for. When you say this sort of 3D printing comes into picture, either it is going to be uh, selective laser melting or selective laser sintering. There are certain aspects where we have to keep very cautiously in our mind before going ahead because we have to check what is the powder particle that we are dealing with and what is the spot diameter that has been used for uh, melting the powders. So when you say spot diameter which is used for melting the powders, we find that once when we substantially increase the spot diameter, the bonding does not happen effectively because the concentration of laser energy density gets easily scattered away. So in fact, there is a type of loss of energy taking place. So when you restrict them into an optimized way within uh, uh, like uh, 2 to 3 mm, the entire laser energy density is getting focused on that particular point and as an effect of that you will be getting even more better uh, like uh, uh, you will be getting better melting uh, efficiency and that particular melting efficiency will assist us in getting a proper alloy formation and that particular alloy formation will help us in meeting the required function or like meeting the required characterizations of the uh, components that we are planning to use. And as an effect of this, you can see that this boroscope process are basically components allowed used by technicians in monitoring the condition of turbine blades. So basically this particular device is used for overhauling or like periodical checking by the 
uh, users or the machinists who are dealing with turbines. And here it is used for low pressure turbines in Airbus, which is also a real time application where we are been using this component for monitoring purposes. And it was manufactured using UAS and the material is nickel and the methodology is directly is sintering. Again, this is a sintered component. Then you can see that though the perfect alloying or like perfect bonding has not been made in spite of that, this particular component seems to be or like it is visible, visibly seen that the alloying has been not completely done, but still the powder packing or the compaction of the powder is really good. And uh, also there is not much porosity found. That is why we are able to easily uh, cut these threads uh, through these holes, which is effectively helping us to join them in the real time application. If there is going to be lots of voids or any sort of distortion that is taking place during fabrication, this sort of post machining process, a type of hybrid machining, which is widely carried out for 3D components in order to put them into real time application is not going to be easy. What is the problem is like either the entire layer gets distorted or in other words, this creates the stress accumulation. Uh, it becomes a stress racer. So eventually when there is a lot of stress races getting accumulated here and there in a component, that will be the initial point where the crack initiation propagates and eventually the material become, lands in failure. So once the crack propagation comes into picture, we should also keep in mind that uh, in which particular point the crack is about to be probed. If it is a surface level crack, then fine, at least in a visible inspection that can be directed and it can be overhauled. But if the same crack is going to be within the body, then that's even more perilous. So in order to avoid all these stuffs, we have to optimize the laser processing parameters like spot diameter, laser power density, and the number of tracks that you are going to utilize and what type of pattern you are going to, like, uh, going to utilize for uh, manufacturing components. So these are the primary things that you have to keep in mind before stepping into the fabrication of a real-time component. And you can see this here. This is one such device which is again used for another uh, like a, uh, aerospace application which has been only used by GB Aviations where you see that a fuel nozzle, the fuel nozzle is being developed again by using a laser-based SLM process where uh, selective laser melting is done and this is the final product you can see here at the bottom. The final product which is used for where the fuel nozzle is being built and this is being used a pressure atomizing unit receives fuel under high pressure so basically the real-time application where this component is deployed is an environment where it is being continuously attacked with high pressure so what happens is we have to ensure the surface of the, the surface finish of the component is good enough that or it is in the optimized micron level so that that does not become a site of crack initiation subjected to this high pressure in which the environment is pushing. So when, when the environment is subject, like uh, continuously pushing the subject into high stress, what happens is eventually if there is uh, like a, there is no possibility of adapting to that high pressure, easily the component will give up. And as an effect of that giving outness or like once it gives up, then that is going to be a disastrous uh, ending where the component will again land in failure and when you use this in sort of this uh, high pressure fuel manifold or like a, in this sort of fuel injection uh, motor what happens is this fuel nozzle has to have proper line in order to it should not only have the pressure that is created due to air or any compacted air environment but also it should also withstand the high temperature that it is uh, being deployed in because this sort of uh, temperature deployment should not lead in any sort of fatigue failure. That should also be kept in the mind. So this is where 3D printing has very well helped people in achieving, uh, like uh, you can engineer the microstructure as per your requirement. That is one particular huge advantage that you're getting. Like for example, we know that this particular component is to be deployed in a temperature where high temperature is being as the environment then you have to go for the respective microstructures like you can have a lot of columnar microstructures being engineered and homogeneously just by keeping a lot of columnar structures you can address the creep properties of the materials so with this particular uh, advantages that we are availing out of the process which is not available in conventional casting this is where researchers have successfully 
prove themselves that 3D printer components are effective in real time functioning as well. So apart from that, this is another equipment where star tracker bracket, which is used in satellites mostly. And these satellites, which are uh, like uh, usually used for brackets, which is having very good tensile strength. And of course, there are certain also applications where this particular uh, brackets will have porous structure in them. Like, for example, if they are porous stru by structure, the weight of the component will be substantially less. As we all know that when you are deploying any component for a satellite based application, the lesser the weight, the better the profit, because that will assist us in or increase the mileage of the rocket fuel that we are putting in for the uh, launch. So whatever component we are making, if it has it should always alarm our mind when we are going for aerospace component that the strength has to be good as well as uh, the uh, weight weight of the component should be uh, as much as possible in a minimum way so that that can be assisting us in getting a job done quite easily so these are the two parameters and based on these particular two parameters in focus this particular fabrication has been done it is used in satellites again the reduction of weight is the biggest success of this particular project and uh, aluminum silicon at 10 mg magnesium is the device uh, is the material that is being used and again it is used with direct material metal laser sintering so this particular laser sintering also is very much helpful in creating porous structures. And that is the reason why this particular application has been dealt with laser direct metal laser sintering. And as an effect of that, we also know that the strength of the material is to be superior with moderate and lightweight, you can say, in other words. And this thrust chamber in a rocket engine. So this thrust chamber in rocket engine is going to play a crucial role in the projection or to create the rocket travel. So when you say this, we all know that the thrust chamber will obviously be uh, subjected to large amount of stresses in the form of thermal or in the form of any set of external stresses. And this is very, very common. And of course, this is inevitable as well in this particular application. So uh, you can change the orientation of the microstructure in such a way or like you can build in a single microstructure element throughout this components where uh, this will be effectively countering the external defects or in other words this can be effectively utilized in countering the external defects so here in this particular application we see that it is manufactured using selective laser melting and uh, we also see that the material used is nickel and super alloy in 708 so here this is one important parameter that we have to keep our mind alarming or like nickel and the other one is uh, super alloy, nickel based super alloy, but IN718. So, this particular grade is widely used for uh, over uh, like uh, this uh, aerospace applications for their substantial properties of good strength. But even in this IN in kernel alloy, we find that uh, there is one common drawback that is pulling in from putting in maximum temperature. Like what happens is when you expose in kernel more than 700 degrees Celsius, we, it is a common observation that the yield point of that particular material falls down drastically. So when you say that the yield point of the material falls down drastically, we also have to keep in our mind that when you are deploying this in a real time aerospace application, especially what happens is like uh, we just have to ensure that once after the launch, the equipment should not get out of our hand or like uh, in other words it should not something be something like uh, in a state where anything can happen at any time so the reliability of that entire component comes into the scatter or like it becomes a question mark so in order to improve uh, the reliability among the component and gain the confidence of the user we have to opt for methodologies where selective laser melting where comparatively you find that the crack initiation or the uh, residual stress accumulation is beyond one point it is getting diluted and distorted beyond one particular point where the accumulation is taking place and uh, this also assist and as i said there is one point to be addressed as well when it crosses 700 degrees celsius the yield point falls very bad, drastically down so when to address this particular issue, scientists have come with uh, certain methodologies where there are certain particular microstructures and the entire component is built under certain power density where uh, the microstructure is good enough in 
uh, maintaining the yield point and uh, also to postpone that uh, yield point failure when it is crossing high temperature or like when it is subjected to high temperature. And here this SLM process, selective laser melting process was opted, opted in order to have a proper heavy structure with good uh, quality outputs or properties that will help the component to fight the or to counter the damages that is being caused externally. So injector head for rocket engine. Again, when it says rocket engine, the injector head, as I said that the initially we also saw the nozzle that has been built for two-wheeler applications where or it is also it can also be used in four-wheeler applications where the nozzle fuel injection is being done. Similarly, the injection head which is kept in a rocket engine, as it shows there is a complex structure or in other words you can say that repeatability of the structure plays a crucial role in this particular application you can see that the samples uh, the pillars that are being impinged or implanted on that particular plate we find that they are almost identical to each other they are complete they are in fact completely identical to each other you cannot it is very hard to uh, like uh, pick out uh, which is having different dimensions and what so this sort of uh, like uh, conventionally manufacturing we have to rely on casting based processes to get this job done and of course uh, in order to like uh, built in a lot of comp similar components of course the cycle can be same and one particular slot the entire thing can be occupied but to maintain this homogeneity is that the first task so that is why researchers have shown the uh, using the same uos system again in coral uh, nickel based super alloy the ending in coral sound alloy has been fabricated and the process is dilute metal sintering here and uh, there are almost like 248 components assembled in the fabrication route and uh, by this the cost if we reduced by 50% and lead time also reduces by a factor of 3. So this not only assists us in getting a component of uh, continuous repeatability but also there is one particular advantage where we can observe that uh, high skilled manpower is not much essential only thing is we should just go for a guy who has very good programming knowledge and with his good programming knowledge we can come up with these identical components in a very precise way quite easily and in case to the worst case if there is any flaws that can also be detected then and there so this antenna bracket in the satellite that is also one of the 3d printer structures which is very recently done as it is shown here in the image where this is the this particular one the one where i'm showing is with the tick mark is the conventionally manufactured uh, 3d bracket and here this is a 3d printed uh, component where you can see that again a uh, lots of hollowness are the structure itself is a bit hollow and uh, that will assist us in reducing the weight as well as it provides some good strength to maintain for the real-time application in the satellites uh, antennas of the satellite and again this particular operation is being used uh, or it has been fabricated using ui systems and this particular material is aluminum silicon magnesium and the process is direct metal sintering and the weight is reduced by 50 percent if uh, the weight is this particular satellite is reduced by 50 percent that is going to have substantial effect in providing extra space for carrying much more equipment or in other words also it reduces the weight of the rocket where the fuel efficiency can be drastically improved while comparing the conversion one and this is that titanium plate where this particular titanium inserts are widely used in aerospace sectors and you see that it has been made out of aetos and you can also see the material is Ti 6 4 lv which is one of the common material which is widely used in uh, aerospace industries. And again, selective laser melting based process is done. The weight is reduced by almost 1.45 kgs in than the conventionally manufactured component. And uh, from, uh, sorry, it is even more beyond in a conventional beyond, it is coming somewhere around 1500. And here it has come to 500. So it is not just about reducing the weight. This might be some fascinating facts that will motivate you to opt this particular technology. But you should also ensure that the strength that you are deploying for this particular technology, uh, the components that are being deployed in real-time application should have adequate strength to uh, like bear up the load and meet up the application successfully. Because unless or until we are, if we are not able to achieve that very specifically, Whatever may be the biggest product of all, again, it is of uh, a very big question mark when it is coming to utility if they are not meeting the application precisely without any failure.
So these are the titanium inserts which is being widely used. And uh, finally, the seat belt buckle, which is widely used in our cars and as well as aircrafts. You can see this whenever we are traveling in airbus. And these components are also 3D printed in order to ensure that they are lightweight in structure. And again, depending upon the lightweight, as not only the lightweight, but also adequate strength should be possessed in the output. In that uh, accord uh, or like in that objective, people have chosen for Tie 6 4A LV material for the uh, 3D printing of this particular and which leave, uh, like a seat belt buckle which is used in aircrafts and uh, from here again it is like uh, you can see that it saves up to 72.5 kg here this data says that in this particular reference yeah the day, uh, weight reduction has come to 72.5 kgs when we are replacing it with 3d printed buckles than the conventionally manufactured buckles so this is one particular jet turbine stator so this is also another uh, aerospace application component which is shown. Again, it is used for direct material scintilling and it shows that 70% shorter development at time and performance uh, increased to 300 RPM, like 13,000 RPM. So when you say this 13,000 RPM improvement is there and you have put 75% shorter development time, that itself is going to fetch the company a huge profit. So this particular application will assist us in getting uh, not only a complex output which has been 3D printed and it has been customized, but also a better quality output than the conventionally casted components. And uh, this particular uh, age uh, that we are uh, like in this particular uh, age where modern uh, art along with fabrication technique has been taken over. We find that uh, this uh, are effective replacements when it comes to direct material based deposition and selective laser sintering can be done. And of course, 75% shorter in time and this 13,000 RPM efficiency, which is increased and it has been proved. This shows the progress of the 3D printing technology in aerospace components. So, of course, uh, like uh, within the given time, this is I'm coming into the conclusion part. And uh, here we say that uh, the developing standards like ASTM standards and ISO standards that are being actively being taken care. And of course, we have lots of uh, scientists who are actively working in, in developing the standards of this uh, laser based additive manufacturing and 3D printing techniques. And uh, this standard will generally reduce the overhead cost and also the quick fabrication time, which has been effectively utilized. And uh, that will improve the productivity of the component that we are dealing with. And uh, once after the productivity is improved, then we see that the developing standards will be, in fact uh, help us counter the current challenges that we are facing. Like uh, there are the, the surface cracks and other surface uh, uh, dents and other drawbacks that has been widely coming into picture. We can also address them in an effective way, in an in-situational way. Like this 3D printing and additive manufacturing can also, it is not only used for uh, fabricating new components, it can also used to, to it can also be used to mend the existing components that are conventionally done because that will help us to match up with the microstructure which is already available in the existing component much more effectively and efficiency efficiently so that the built structures which are built out of this heavy investment can also be extended their life can also be extended which will give us very good profit so these standards can help us in achieving that and now uh, like uh, we IIT Jammu from my lab we are actively collaborating with DSR, DSIR in developing the standards for repairing the existing components using 3D printing as well that is one project parallel going on and also once when we address these top three points we can also effectively and most importantly improve the reliability of these fabricated components so these are the uh, biggest uh, advantages that we will be getting through once when we adapt to 3D printing for this higher end components. And these are the components, uh, the images which I have shown here are nothing but uh, these are 3D printed components. These are smart structures like nickel titanium shape memory alloys, which are used for again aerospace applications in wings of the aircrafts, in actuating the flappers uh, in aircrafts, are being actively used, uh, replaced by nickel titanium. And this particular nickel titanium is fabricated using this 3D printing technology and additive manufacturing technology. 
so this is the conclusion and here 3d printing at iit jammu we have uh, this uh, laboratory for advanced manufacturing and processing which is my research lab and we do have a lot of laser cladding facility and wire arc additive manufacturing facility and also we do have lots of high power, high power lasers both pulsed and continuous wave which can effectively help us in surface processing techniques to improve the surface roughness and improve the surface finish of the products that we are dealing with and that will assist us in giving us some good quality products with efficient output as well we are working on it currently we are addressing projects from uh, isro and diadio which is actively running as live projects in our output where we are trying to fabricate 3d printed components for mechanical applications which are being widely used and uh, this is our uh, process of 3d printing and i like uh, i'm happy to invite all to have active collaborations with us as well to be part of our lamp lab so that uh, that can be efficiently helpful in enriching and uh, having better engineering knowledge in the components so at the outset i would like to thank all the organizers for giving me this opportunity and thank you for all the attenders for your valuable time uh, you have spent in uh, attending my talk so this particular session i'm always uh, free for discussion and i'm expecting some doubts or like any sort of queries to be addressed thank you thank you very much organizers thank you i thank ssme very much for this particular uh, specific on uh, a specific note and uh, professor uh, like uh, dr verma dr singh and uh, all the other members who have kindly arranged this talk and assisted me in delivering this lecture successfully thank you thank you all. Any doubts to be addressed, sir? Anyone? Audible. Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Audible. Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Shiva, this is SS Gill from Space Application Center. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, yeah, you have shown very good slides and shown the development in the area of uh, uh, the 3D printing, particularly Thank in you. metal. Yes, sir. And, yes, sir. Yes, uh, sir. But uh, I wanted to know that you are working on this laser-based surface processing. Yeah, yes, which was not mentioned in this uh, presentation. Can you throw some light on that? What exactly? Yeah, actually what we basically do is, sir, laser-based surface processing can be bifurcated into three types, sir. One is laser annealing, which is widely used for trimming out the excessive amount of residual stress, which is being uh, used uh, or it, which is getting developed when we are building 3D printed components. Like, for example, once when we find out that the surface residual stress is going beyond certain limit, that itself is acting as a problem to create, uh, which is leading to the generation of cracks in the surface of the components. When we use this sort of laser surface annealing that trims out these like the localized heat supply in that particular component or in that particular uh, stress raising points that will assist us in postponing any crack formation that is one way we do processing second is laser shock pinning laser shock pinning is an effective method where we induce compressive residual stress on the surface of the components like what we do is in conventional way or conventional uh, industries they go for this methodology called as shock pinning where they use our grid blasting where they use beads and they continuously impinge uh, some uh, heat they heat samples uh, surface using some sort of beads and ball dresses where a compressive stress is being induced because the more the compressive stress is on the surface of the sample that will be much more effective in countering the external failures and defects yeah, and the yeah, third sure. method okay, yes maybe, uh, because we want to continue with the other presentation as well fine, i would sir, like fine, to sir. ask you that uh, this uh, wire arc additive manufacturing yes and sir. this powder bed technology yes sir then what is the advantage of uh, wire arc method over the ah, wire arc, yes sir in powder based uh, technologies what happens is sir we have to take immense care in handling the powders preheating powders and uh, this uh, laser uh, interaction with the powders very effectively only then we have a promise that uh, we are going to have a good product of good quality and also one more important parameter is uh, the void formation and the packing density of the output product whereas in case of wire there will be no deviation in the composition there will be no unwanted secondary phase formation and as of that there is no brittleness being induced so these are the, the homogeneous composition is being maintained throughout the fabricated component so these are the advantages of wire over powders because and also one more observation which i personally faced uh, like uh, we're using this technology is 
60 percent uh, of uh, efficient deposition happens when it comes to powder whereas in case of wire that is 90 percent plus so these are the advantages we get wire over powder sir. right dr shiva you have thrown a, a very good light on the subject thank you and, sir. Uh, we will personally also interact with you if anything uh, sure sir i am always yes. welcome for that and we have uh, already you. some active projects thank going thank you on. very much for thank you. uh, your presentation thank you sir. thank you sir thank, thank you very much for the presentation thank you thank you very much thank you over so, to Vivek. Thanks a lot, uh, Gil, sir. And thanks a lot, uh, Professor Siva, sir. Thank you, sir. And uh, you. now our uh, we would like to, we will have a talk and presentation by our webinar sponsor, Elter. So the talk will be on the topic, simulation-driven design for additive manufacturing uh, by uh, Mr. Vishal Bagdotia. So uh, I... Uh, 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 I formally welcome Dr. Uh, Vishal. Dr. Vishal is uh, graduated in mechanical engineering, uh, having more than uh, four years of experience in research and new product development in automotive, defense, and aerospace industry. Currently, he's working as an assistant technical manager for LTR simulations, suits at the design technology systems. So with this uh, short introduction, I invite uh, Mr. Vishal for the presentation. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for the introduction. I hope I'm audible. Yes, uh, very well audible. I'll just share my screen. Uh, yeah. So I think we will have the presentation for five minutes or more. Sir, uh, 10 to 15 minutes. I will wrap it, wrap it up as soon as possible. OK. OK. All right, sir. So can you see my pre uh, complete presentation screen? Yes, we are able to see, sir. Sure. All right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So with that, I'll proceed with the uh, session. Uh, Dr. Shiva, uh, a really nice session on the introduction towards uh, right from introduction to uh, 3D printing to the various aspects of it, as well as the advantages over traditional manufacturing techniques and the various uh, printing techniques as well as materials that you had discussed. So on the similar lines, I'll be talking about uh, the role of simulation as well in, in terms of design for additive manufacturing as well as the various uh, manufacturing uh, process optimizations that we can carry out so when we talk about additive manufacturing when we talk about designs and light weighting all of these go hand in hand and the main advantages towards going towards light weighting when it comes to additive manufacturing is to reduce the material consumption increase the printing time as well as lower the cost like you really mentioned uh, the uh, increase in production cost when it goes towards uh, traditional manufacturing technique uh, be it molding or uh, the tool development is quite high and we are trying to reduce that by using additive manufacturing and when we talk about light weighting in terms of designs, uh, two of the major techniques in terms of design goes uh, into picture that is lattice structure generation as well as topology optimization. That is something that we'd uh, be discussing in this session uh, to take it forward as well as the main advantage of light weighting and doing the design for additive manufacturing is to uh, have assemb assembly consolidation. We are trying to reduce uh, n number of components and consolidate into one single uh, part is what we'd be talking about. So I'll divide this presentation into three sections. Sections. One is the concept generation and optimization. The second is printing process simulation when it uh, comes to uh, selective laser melting parts. And the third would be uh, powder simulation for uh, uh, an actual additive manufacturing machine. So what's our point of view when it comes to topology approach? So when it comes to a typical optimization process that uh, we deal with, uh, with our suit of solutions of optimization, uh, be it Alter Inspire, uh, which is to take up a design, which is a baseline design, your initial raw design, and establish its baseline performance and to understand its design requirements. Once you have that, you can move on towards developing a, a particular package space of that particular design. And once you move on with that, you can basically check the various uh, design flows, the overall material layout of that design. So that is how mainly topology optimization would work out in that case. And once you have that particular uh, baseline design, you can reiterate by applying various manufacturing constraints, depending on how you want to take it forward, be it casting, printing, molding, and so on. And later on, take it forward for various types of manufacturing process simulation as well, and then finally arrive towards a, a configuration. Uh, 
so when we talk about uh, these manufacturing constraints and how we can control these designs in a uh, topology optimization environment is by imposing various constraints like member thicknesses or the draw direction or the extrusion and when we specifically talk about additive manufacturing is to give constraints to generate self sustaining structures we are trying to minimize support as much as possible in our design so we need our structures to be self sustaining it should not have many cross members is what we are trying to aim for so we can implement these manufacturing constraints in our design to get a, a good optimized structure out of it so like i said different designs different concepts so as we can see for a same component for a same uh, i would say base component we have multiple iterations of designs based on what kind of uh, manufacturing actually constraints i'm actually applying for it so to get into more detail uh, we'll specifically talk about our point of view in terms of purely additive manufactured structures and to take an example like uh, so had shown in the previous slide of uh, this particular antenna bracket we st the the story behind this bracket was the initial cad model was taken the initial design was taken which was actually a fabricated and bolted structure uh, which weighed a lot uh, made up of aluminum and that particular structure was taken for concept generation to understand how this particular um, loading is actually behaving in this uh, structure what is the overall stress distribution in this and it was taken for topology optimization once this particular design was optimized it was also fine tuned because the structure that we get from topology would be quite sharp right so it was then pro post processed it was fine tuned and a smooth car was created so that a smooth uh, printed part would get generated out of it that part was then ev uh, evaluated and it was then manufactured which resulted in overall 43% uh, mass reduction as well as increase in its uh, natural frequency and also it improved its overall static and strength behavior in similar lines we have uh, other example from space il which is an in israeli space agency where they optimized a moon th moon uh, landing uh, thruster bracket wherein a similar bracket where uh, which weighed around 40 kg having a frequency of 80 hertz was taken for uh, optimization and concept generation the first optimization concept was developed the overall design tendency was understood out of it like what is the overall mass flow and uh, the material layout in this and a feasible design was then developed and with respect to that a final design was interpreted it was analyzed and then it was virtually validated which resulted which resulted in a decrease in mass as well as increasing its uh, overall frequency and this was the overall um, structure which was actually uh, manufactured and assembled over here uh, a similar example that we saw earlier that was like a star that was a star bracket initially uh, a traditional structure taken for optimization and carried out uh, the overall verification was carried out and tested out so that was about the topology approach when it comes to uh, the overall optimization for additive manufacturing another approach is lattice generation which is which takes a slightly different route where the material layout is not exactly controlled uh, using the load cases but it ha the overall packet space is being filled with lattice structures so lattice also provides better stability gives a good thermal behavior as well as better weight characteristics so in terms of lattice as well we have two approaches when when it comes to optimization or lattice generation one is tetrahedral lattice which is shaped like a tetrahedral which is essentially like a continuous lattice structure which gets generated out of a solid uh, component that we have and it gives good uh, performance in terms of its stiffness and minimizing the mass uh, and it is also a structural lattice i would say it is not just a dumb fill lattice this gets this type of lattice gets generated based on the overall elements that you create based on the beam thicknesses that you assign and it carries out a size optimization and generates this beam type of lattice so it so, so it would have varying uh, cross sections across the overall model based on where the overall uh, stress concentration is the second type of lattice that we offer is a, a dumb fill lattice wherein a given packet space uh, you can just fill it up with lattice based on the given configuration that you would set so we can we have different unit cell lattice uh, shapes available like bcc uh, fcc uh, various types of trusses that you can see over here and based on the overall dimensions and the length of the lattice that you said it will just fill up those overall packet spaces so either of these can be taken for uh, generating a lattice structure and then analyze 
optimizing its performance and taking it forward for additive manufacturing. So an STL file can be exported from either of these uh, examples that we are seeing and it can be taken forward for printing. So talking about printing, so once we have established these processes of uh, generating a structure, optimizing them, we would want to move on towards the manufacturing process of it as well. So when it comes to printing process, why it is necessary? Uh, it is essentially necessary to avoid failures, be it geometric issues, saving time, overall uh, understanding the uh, filling time, uh, uh, sorry, understanding the overall part processing time and the part orientation, evaluating risk, uh, based, basically if there is some high stress occurring in that particular model or what kind of deform deformations would happen thermal distortions would happen as well as predicting the overall optimization production time optimizing its production production time so in order to tackle these challenges of 3d printing uh, process simulation when it comes to a later uh, a laser uh, powder bed fusion method or i would say slm approach we have inspire print 3d which is a process driven printing simulation tool wherein you can basically select your part, select the overall materials for it, configure the printer, orient your part, generate your supports. You can preview the slicing. You can also uh, export it out into STL and then run all, uh, a thermomechanical analysis of it. So to get into more details about uh, Inspire Print 3D, what uh, it has to offer in terms of printing simulation. So you can configure printers from uh, EOS, SLM solutions or Renishore, or you can also give your user defined uh, data of the printer, be it hatching, be it uh, the uh, latency and so on. You can simulate various printing materials. Uh, the available library includes aluminum, inconel, uh, stainless steel, titanium, which can be user defined by giving the overall thermomechanical properties. You can generate the support, which can be in terms of a block, a rod, uh, an edge cell lattice or tree. And you can also set the various process parameters of the printer, uh, which is basically the layer by layer strategy, the, the velocity, the laser power, the powder layer thickness, absorption rate, uh, cooling time, and also the base temperature, which would then give you a result in terms of the displacement of the component that would occur during the printing, the plastic strain, the even uh, the thermal properties, and so on. So uh, to talk about how this Inspire Print 3D works in terms of the simulation approach is basically it's a layer by layer approach wherein the model is divided uh, using FEM. Uh, there would be elements involved which would be uh, activated layer by layer. So this is let's say this is the first layer of element. Uh, currently it would conduct based on the base plate uh, thermal uh, properties and so on. Uh, and the next layer will actually get activated and based on that there will be conduction, there will be radiation uh, occurring between those layers. There will be layer uh, activation cooling next layer would come in and that process will repeat uh, on and on till the complete uh, part has been generated once that happens there will be some some kind of a spring back that will happen in this particular model based on the overall thermal distortions and properties and that can be taken into consideration during simulation so to to just uh, talk about how uh, how we have uh, verified that and verified the uh, various performance of components so this is one of the cantilever beam that was taken for uh, printing and it was actually uh, printed in reality and the overall displacement and stresses were uh, displacements uh, were checked and that were measured experimentally like you can see in the actual case it spring back uh, by 5 mm in the simulation it spring back by 5.2 mm and so on and similarly this was another uh, antenna bracket which was actually uh, optimized first so that it generates less amount of support by giving a self sustaining structure and it was taken for uh, Printing simulation and validation, wherein it, the overall uh, thermal deformations were observed at, uh, at a similar location, and having the overall values that you can see as 0.5 mm in the actual case and 0.6 mm in the uh, case of simulation near those locations. And those were actually analyzed using a 3D scanner and understood after the overall manufacturing was done. So we have several case studies, uh, several uh, cases with partners like Alstom, uh, Airbus, Polaris, IP, IPC, and Maestro for these kind of applications of printing simulation and also additive manufactured, um, also optimized structures along with that. 
uh, in order to move towards uh, the third section so the main talk about uh, the promise of additive manufacturing when it comes to design for additive manufacturing topology optimization and printing simulation is we get geometric freedom we get part consolidation accelerated product, product development as well as design individuality based on like we saw uh, we are cutting down on production time we are trying to reduce more and more uh, number of parts uh, to get an optimized structure and we have a geometric freedom because uh, that can be eliminated using additive manufacturing to move on to the third section we'll be talking about uh, uh, powder uh, simulation for additive manufacturing where we will be using a discrete element modeling technique and for that uh, i would like to pass on the session to uh, mr abhijit kulkarni uh, who will be talking about uh, this in more detail so abhijit so over to you yeah thank you vishal so i will take a couple of minutes uh, so where we have seen uh, the 3d print process simulation so in which uh, we have seen the concept design uh, which uh, where you have used uh, the topology optimization the combination of topology optimization and lattice generation and then further you have checked the 3d print process simulation where you want to see during the printing process uh, what could be the warpage and thermomechanical behavior so last uh, we have uh, basically the edam uh, which is a discrete element modeling technology so which is again acquired by altair and uh, with this you can able to check say for example the powder spreading mechanism so generally whenever there is a metal printing the there are uh, powders spraying uh, so where you have a support material as well as the model material which is sprayed layer by layer and then the complex part would be formed but during this printing the total time taken by the printer it depends on the the feet of the powder the speed of the powder and again depends on the powder uh, uh, basically uh, uh, quality so all these parameters you cannot check so probably uh, the user who want to do the printing of a complex part he has to check visually and based on that he again change the feed rate or speed of the uh, roller or something like that and then probably he can optimize it so with the help of discrete element modeling techniques you can probably check the spreading performance so for that you can model this powder and uh, uh, the different aspects of the spreading mechanism and improving the powder spraying you can do it with the help of edam so that is whole idea about uh, this technology and right now we have this uh, technology in an alter suit of solution so where you can uh, evaluate the printer design as well as the setup you can check the different process condition and you can check the different materials and ultimately you can reduce the total time required for the printing so with the help of edam uh, the concept design technology and 3d print process simulation so you can able to optimize a complete uh, 3d print process simulation thank you so much Thank you, sir. Uh, so with this, we come to an end uh, of our uh, presentation for simulation driven design approach uh, for additive manufacturing. Uh, if there are any questions, uh, we'd be happy to answer them. So uh, thank you, sir, for thank you, uh, SSME team for giving us this platform to present our. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, after this, we have a formal vote of thanks and I would like to propose the same. First of all, I am thankful to Dr. Shiva S, today's speaker, for his uh, talk on 3D printing for aerospace applications. Thank you very much, sir, for your talk. Also, thank you, Mr. Vishal, for his uh, talk on uh, simulation-driven design for additive manufacturing. Also, I am thankful to Mr. Vivek Singh for uh, providing uh, our Google Meet platform. Also, for uh, Mr. Dignesh Thesia for YouTube live streaming. Mr. Jigar Gandhi for welcoming the audience and introduction to speaker. I am also thankful to Mr. SS Gill, head MPSF SEC ISRO, for moderating this question answer session. And also thankful to uh, Dilip Bhatt, sir, uh, for his uh, nice uh, uh, interaction with us and uh, motivating us on YouTube platform also. We are also thankful to Altair team actually for uh, basically sponsor this uh, whole webinar series.
I'm thankful to SSME President A.V. Pathak sir, Vice President Ulkesh Desai and all SSME team members uh, for their uh, continuous support for this webinar talk and uh, other uh, things also. I'm thankful to Horse Showroom, uh, Vikram Hall staff and ESSD team for providing us this platform through Space Application Center. Uh, thank you very much once again uh, for those directly or indirectly involved for this successful event. And uh, we'll let you soon uh, the next topic and uh, date. It is mostly it is proposed on 17th of December by Dr. Uh, Samir uh, Khandekar. Uh, see you soon. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.